Welcome to the LACNETS podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Yen. I'm the LACNETS Director of Programs and Outreach, as well as a caregiver and advocate for my husband who is living with NET. In each podcast episode, we talk to a NET expert who answers your top 10 questions. This podcast is for educational purposes only and does not constitute medical advice. Please discuss your questions and concerns with your physician. Welcome to the LACNETS podcast. I'm really excited today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Mohammed Bassam Sambal, and he is a hematologist oncologist at the Mayo Clinic in Phoenix, Arizona, who has a special interest in neuroendocrine tumors and gastrointestinal malignancies. In addition to his clinical activities, he's very active in research that focuses on investigating novel treatments, including targeted therapy, immunotherapy, and other agents that could potentially help patients with neuroendocrine and gastrointestinal cancers. We've known that he's well-published, and you can see his name alongside many of our other speakers and friends, including Dr. Thor Heth Donerson and Jason Starr, who are well-known to the LACNETS community. Dr. Sambal focuses on holistic treatment for cancer patients, taking into consideration their medical and social aspects that have been affected by their cancer diagnosis. And a fun fact is that he practices what he preaches. He loves running, which... As I mentioned, he lives in Phoenix, Arizona, where it's triple digits until after sunset. So running in Arizona poses its own challenges, but we really love how he practices what he preaches. And I just wanted to add that I've heard so much about Dr. Sambal. He's spoken very highly of by his colleagues, so much so that I made it a point to meet him in person last year at the Nanit Symposium. And I've seen these publications specifically on this topic well-differentiated grade three nets, which is a tricky and unique subset of net. So I'm really pleased to have you join us today, Dr. Sambal. Welcome to LACNETS and our podcast today. Well, thank you very much, Lisa. I appreciate it. Thanks for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here, and I've definitely been looking forward to this uh, nice conversation with the great audience. So happy to be here. So glad to have you. And before we jump into the 10 questions... I was wondering if you might just share how you got involved in the NET community and what got you interested in neuroendocrine tumors. That's an excellent question. I think it's really mainly during my training, my fellowship training, I did have increased interest in gastrointestinal cancers and neuroendocrine tumors. And in our group, there's really in Phoenix, Arizona, Mayo Clinic, there's five of us, and each one of us kind of focus a little bit on specific group of cancers. So my main focus has been with the neuroendocrine tumors and upper GI cancers. What got me really interested in neuroendocrine tumors is really the uniqueness. I mean, the incidence is rare, which makes it kind of definitely interesting. The presentation is definitely interesting. And then the patient population is really great patient population. And we always see patients are heavily interested in knowing more about their disease and they come in prepared, educated. So the conversation is they take it to a different level. Sometimes I talk to neuroendocrine patients and it's as if I'm talking to someone who's medically trained. They impress me a lot of times with their questions. So that has been uh, one of the main things that kind of drove me to this. And of course, in addition to that, I think What plays career-wise, what plays into the picture is mentorship. So my mentor in GI cancer is Dr. Saab, but I got introduced to Dr. Hafdaners and was known to the group, and he's been really a great mentor to me during this journey. Yeah, the people and connections matter, and it's amazing how the mentorship makes a difference and also the patients who inspire you. Yeah. Yeah, and some people may not know that there's a Mayo Clinic in Phoenix. I encounter people who don't know that, and... It's wonderful that you're there, literally in the desert, but also sometimes a medical desert. Could you explain a little bit about how that Mayo Clinic in Phoenix works? I've been asked, like, is this a satellite office? Do you have a separate neuroendocrine tumor clinic or a neuroendocrine tumor multidisciplinary team versus the main campus? How does it work? Yeah, so Mayo Clinic has three main campuses. So there is the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, which is the original one long time ago. And then there is one in Mayo Clinic, Florida, which was built, I think, 1986. And then there is the Mayo Clinic in Phoenix, Arizona, which was built in 1987. And they are built and they operate as three main campuses, but under one umbrella, which is the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center. So the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center is really the three campuses together. And then we have satellite offices, mainly in the Midwest, they are called the Mayo Clinic Health System. So... 
yes, they are separate campuses, but we collaborate and operate in a kind of a team manner. For example, let's say I want to bring clinical study for neuroendocrine tumors to Mayo Clinic, then I'll bring it and present it to the three campus groups. So like Dr. Havdanerson, Dr. Starr, and others, and kind of we discuss, you know, whether this is feasible, important, and things like that. So three different campuses, it kind of gives us the advantage of reaching and expanding to patient populations and trying to help these patients. At the same time, we'll operate and we'll work as a team. In the three campuses, they have a multidisciplinary tumor uh, boards and things like that. So in May, Arizona, we do have that, where surgeons who have a main interest in neuroendocrine tumors, even like liver transplant, docs, pathologists, and things like that. So that's kind of in the separate fashion. And then on the same level with the teamwork, we do have like almost a monthly meeting between the neuroendocrine tumor docs discussing some cases, discussing studies, and things like that. Yeah, so you have three unique campuses and all the benefits of working together in a team with being able to share clinical trials and data and expertise. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I know that there you've been able to make quite an impact, and we saw it recently on a patient story, which we'll share on our podcast page as well. A patient who shares specifically about the impact it made to see a neuroendocrine tumor specialist, and specifically you. Thank you for the difference you're making. Thank you. So as we get started into the questions, I just wanted to kind of preface this with why we're doing specific episodes on the different types of neuroendocrine tumor. And, you know, historically, maybe in the annual conferences or some of the larger events that we do and other neuroendocrine patient education events, there might be a tendency to be lumpers. We kind of lump everyone together because we want to reach as many people as possible. However, we all know that there are differences in the different types of neuroendocrine tumor. And so it may be helpful to be splitters sometimes. So we've had episodes on pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and small bowel, rectal. And so today we're going to talk about specifically well-differentiated grade three neuroendocrine tumors, which I know you're well-versed in. So why don't we jump into 10 questions if you're ready for it? Yeah, let's go. Okay. So the first question is, what are well-differentiated grade three neuroendocrine tumors and where are they located? Yeah, it's a great question because I think it's always important to remember that, you know, neuroendocrine tumors or now more and more we're trying to use neuroendocrine neoplasms. They arise from any part of the body, most commonly pancreas, small bowels or lungs, but they can really literally come in from anywhere. And there are two main important questions, I think. The first question is, has the cancer metastasized or not? Meaning, has it left the original place? Let's say it's a neuroendocrine tumor or cancer of the pancreas. Has it gone from the pancreas and went, uh, like, for example, to liver or bone or something like that or not? That's one of the main questions it's called the stage. And then the other question is about the grade and differentiation. So the stage is about whether the cancer has metastasized or not. The grade and the differentiation is a question really mainly posed to the pathologist. So we ask the pathologist, when you're looking under the microscope, these cells, do they look like the normal cells in the body? And that's what we call well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. They're well-behaved. They look like the normal cells in the body. Or these cancer cells, they look very aggressive, very fast, and even ugly, you know, in the shape, irregular shapes. That's what we call poorly differentiated. So the well-differentiated are well-behaved and poorly differentiated are poorly behaved. And then at the same time also, we tell them, can you do some coloring under the microscope? That's what we call the stain. And tell us how many of these cancer cells are aggressive. So they can actually color the cells that are aggressive with a stain called the KI67 stain. And they can count a score uh, from 0 to 100%. So as you can imagine, it's a spectrum that goes from well differentiated neuroendocrine tumors up to the more aggressive, poorly behaved, we call them carcinoma when they get into the poorly differentiated ones. And then at the same time, we have the KS67 score, which goes from zero to 100%. And based on that, based on the KS67 score, zero to 100, that we split it into three groups, the grade one, grade two, and grade three. So grade three is everything above 20%. So let's step back a little bit. Differentiation is more about the shapes of the cells. Are they well-differentiated, well-behaved cells or not? Or poorly behaved, poorly differentiated. The second thing is the grade. The grade is all about that score, the KS7. How many of these cancer cells are aggressive? 
So historically, really mainly before 2016, when we were looking at neuroendocrine neoplasms in general, neuroendocrine tumors, anything above grade three was automatically assigned to be neuroendocrine carcinoma or poorly differentiated. However, we've seen more and more in multiple studies and in patients that actually there are patients whose KI67, the score, is above 20, so technically they are grade 3, but at the same time, their tumors are well-behaved. The cells, you look at them under the microscope, they look fine. They don't look ugly. They don't look aggressive. So that's why it was very important for the WHO to kind of come up with this new category, which is the in-between. They are grade 3, so they have cancer that's grade 3 because the KS7 is more than 20%. But at the same time, it's well differentiated in neuroendocrine tumors. And they have the features that are actually in the middle, meaning that their tumors are not as slow as the grade one and grade two neuroendocrine tumors, but at the same time, they're not as aggressive and fast as the neuroendocrine carcinoma. And that distinction is very, very important because, I mean, they behave differently in multiple fashions. We're going to discuss that in a second when treatment is different and all of that. Wow, you explained that really well and what a helpful overview to understand the things that you need to look at as a net expert the differentiation how the cells compared to the normal cells and the grade you know patients and people confuse the grade with the stage so you're saying that this category is pretty new and probably misunderstood often oh yeah it's definitely new and unfortunately it's commonly misunderstood even in the medical community that's where it comes in the importance of getting a second opinion from a tertiary center where the medical oncologist is familiar with neuroendocrine tumors and also in addition to that, the pathologist. The pathologist's role is very, very important here. You need the pathologist that's familiar with all of this. Yeah. So we've been talking a lot about how it looks under the microscope and a lot of people and the media even focus a lot on location of tumors. And one of the questions I asked is, well, where is grade three located? So what is more important here? Is it the location, like if it's in the pancreas, or is it the grade or KI-67? I think in general, the most important thing is the grade. I mean, of course, the treatment might differ a little bit between locations, but I do think grade is more important than location. It's important to note that a pretty significant number, the majority of those grade 3 neuroendocrine tumors, the well-differentiated grade 3, they come in from the pancreas. That's kind of a very common site. I would say more than half of them, depending on the series we're looking at, but half or more than half of them come in from that. And then the others are coming from different areas. Yeah, the grade really matters. And another thing that is maybe challenging to understand is if that tumor was cut out, like say the pancreas, is it still a pancreatic net or is it still a grade three net? You mean, so if it is a grade three net that's in the pancreas and... It was surgically removed and then later on it's found in the liver, is that tumor still considered a pancreatic net and is it still considered a grade three net? That's a great question. I think a, a lot of times we should not assume, we should buy out, like if it's taken out from the pancreas and it was grade three net, and now it's coming back in the liver, we see a new thing. I think that new thing should be biopsy to assess. That's also one of the questions that are always being asked. Can these transform? So can a grade one or two transform to a grade three? Or can a grade three net transform to a grade three neck or neuroendocrine cancer? So the well differentiated, well-behaved ones, can they go to the poorly behaved? They can. It's rare, but they can definitely do that. So that's why it's important, I think, to understand the behavior in general. So sometimes if, for example, if I'm seeing a patient and let's say they have a grade three net neuroendocrine tumor, grade three, and I'm following them and suddenly one of the lesions, one of those cancers of spots increased significantly in size that does not fit usually with how things are. Then at that time, I would definitely think about biopsy to rule out that this has changed with a more aggressive neck. Yeah. Okay. The behavior matters. So let's take a step back to when someone's first diagnosed. How are the grade three neuroendocrine tumors usually initially found? And how do you know that it's a grade three? You're talking about looking at it under the microscope. Who does this? How do patients then find this information out? 
So how they're usually found, it's really different depending on the location, but let's take an example of the most common, which is the pancreas. For pancreatic nuts in general, a lot of times they're found incidentally. So the patient is getting a scan for a kidney stone and they find something in the liver or the pancreas and they biopsy that and it's neuroendocrine tumor. Or sometimes, you know, abdominal pain and abdominal distension, some of these GI symptoms that we hear about. That's mainly about the location and if the mass or the cancer is pushing on something that's causing these symptoms. And then can they be secretory, meaning can they be functional? Can they produce hormones? They can, not as much as the grade one and grade two, but they can uh, definitely. But that's pretty rare. So I wouldn't say that's the majority. It's majority, it would be either incidentally found, we're looking for something else, or just because of the location is pushing on something. So what happens is, let's take the example, patient having, you know, distension, abdominal symptoms for a while. They go to their GI doctor after referral from primary care physician. They do scans. They find, let's say, multiple masses or multiple lesions in the liver. And I'm saying the liver because the liver is usually the most common site of where the cancer of the pancreas goes to. And then they biopsy that. And then when they biopsy it, they can biopsy it a lot of times from outpatient biopsy from outside of the skin near their liver. And they go with a needle, numb the area, biopsy it. And then they send the sample to the pathologist. Now the pathologist look under the microscope and then they ask their question, what type of cancer? They say, oh, it's neuroendocrine, has the neuroendocrine features. And then at that time they do some coloring under the microscope, multiple coloring to tell where it's coming from. And then they do the coloring of the KS67. And then they give us, it's a grade one, grade two. And they come up with say, oh, this is a grade three neuroendocrine tumor. And then the patient set up the appointment with medical oncology. Now then we have to make sure that we have complete staging. Meaning, okay, we know it's gone to the liver, but hasn't gone anywhere else. So depending on the situation, we sometimes order CT scans or sometimes MRI scans especially for the liver MRI gives us more information. And then the gap comes into the question, you know, with neuroendocrine tumors, we all hear about the PET scan, the PET dotate or gallium 68 or the newer copper 64. Can we do these or not? Or should we do these or not? I think it's important to remember that for neuroendocrine tumors in general, first of all, we were talking about the spectrum. The majority of the neuroendocrine tumors are well differentiated. The minority are the poorly behaved, poorly differentiated. In the well differentiated space, especially grade one and grade two, the majority of them have on the surface of the cancer cells have like antennas or something on the surface. We call it a receptor. It's called the somatostatin receptor. So those receptors are important because we can inject the patient intravenously with a material, which is a contrast goes all over our body, hook up to the cancer cells, and then they would light up. And that's the concept of the PET dotatate scan. So the PET dotatate is really looking at that. This is in contrast in comparison to the PET FDG, which is the regular PET scan for all other cancers, because the PET FDG is looking at the metabolism, meaning that we give intravenously radioactive sugar to the patient's radioactive glucose, goes all over the body, wherever there are cancer cells that are dividing fast, they would light up. So for neuroendocrine tumors that are well differentiated, the well-behaved ones, grade one and grade two, they're very slow. So if you inject them with radioactive glucose, there is a significant number of them that a cancer would not light up because it's not very fast and dividing. Now here's the thing, this is kind of a long introduction to the grade three net. They are aggressive, but not very aggressive. At the same time, they're well differentiated, meaning because they're well differentiated, a majority of them are positive. They would light up on the dotatate scan. But because they're not as slow as the grade one and grade two, they are more aggressive. They actually, a lot of them, they would also light up on the FTG regular PET. So that's why I do recommend in uh, neuroendocrine tumors grade three net to get dotatate, if the dotatate is negative, to get an FDG, and preferably to get both of them if the insurance allows. So if the dotatate's negative, you would definitely get an FDG PET. If it's positive, you would still want to get an FDG PET. 
in perfect word, I think we should get both of them. There have been multiple studies recently showing the importance of that and how it really helps with the prognosis and treatment, treatment decisions and things like that. I'm saying in perfect word because a lot of times we get resistance from the insurance. Yeah. So in what percentage of patients would that change anything in terms of treatment planning? That's an excellent question. So if the dotatate is negative, we already ruled out two possible therapies and treatments for some of those grade three neuroendocrine tumors that are on the lower end of the spectrum, meaning 20 to 50% or 55%, the ki 67 If the behavior of the tumor is still slow, we can technically treat them with a somatostatin analog, meaning linuretide or sendostatin and things like that. And at the same time, if their dotatate is positive, in addition to the somatostatin analog, at some point in their treatment, PRRT is an option. So I know most of the audience is familiar with PRRT, but for those who are not or new, we discussed how those neuroendocrine tumors on the surface of the cancer cell, they have left antennas or the receptors. The somatostatin analog, the sandostatin or the octreotide or linuretide, they're injected either deep subcutaneously or in the muscle. It goes all over the body, hooked to those cancer cells and stop them from growing, stop them from producing hormones. For the PRRT, there is a drug that's given intravenously. It goes all over the body, hook up to those cancer cells and deliver radiation on the cell level to these cancer cells. So that answers the question of what's the importance of the PET, is if the PET dotatate is negative, then these therapies would not be feasible because the patient does not have those receptors or targets that these drugs work on. Yeah, that would make a difference to know if they had receptors or not. And I'm curious, since this is a unique type of net, how you weigh into the decision surgery. Can grade three net be surgically removed? And how would you decide that if and when and how? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. When we looked at least on our series in Mayo Clinic, we found that the majority of them are diagnosed metastatic. They're not localized, but still in localized, I would definitely push for surgery if possible. So let's say we have a patient that's coming in and there is a pancreatic net that's just found out. And we were discussing in our tumor board and we're considering a surgery. Sometimes the surgeon tells us, and we discuss this, well, let's do some therapy for a few months to see if first, if we can shrink the disease to make the surgery easier. And second, to test the base of the disease, meaning to see if this disease is, is controlled with this therapy or not by therapy. I mean, I'll talk about that in a second systemic treatment, whether oral chemotherapy or uh, something like that, and then go to the surgery if it's controlled, if it's not very aggressive. Because the last thing we want is to go to a big surgery and, for example, the cancer, God forbid, come in you know, within a couple of months or something like that. So can surgery be done? Yes, it can. Can surgery be done even when they are metastatic for selected patients? Yes. The majority of the patient, we say no, but the patient population, it can. Yeah, that's helpful to know because sometimes people think, oh, it's grade three net. This is a scary number. Maybe it can't be operated on. So with the grade three net, I guess, how do you consider medical and non-surgical treatments? And I think a bigger question is how would you then sequence these treatments? I think one of the important things, you know, as you mentioned, we tend to lump things together. But at the end of the day, I think that's where it comes the importance of discussion with the patient and looking at case by case and things like that. By that, I mean, yes, it's a cutoff is 20, but there is nothing magic about that. So I would say a grade three well-differentiated net with a KI67 score of 22% has more features common with a grade two that's 18% than a grade three net of 60% because the numbers are there. So it's a continuous spectrum. There are multiple studies looking at what's the magic cutoff that makes a difference. There's more and more kind of agreement. And if you look at guidelines, they talk about 55%. And again, there is nothing magic about that, but it's a case by case. But usually the lumping when they try to lump is above 55%. Those need a more aggressive treatment than those are less than 55%. So when I look at a patient and see a patient, 
I ask multiple questions. First of all, what is the pace of the disease? Do I have prior scans that tells me, oh, this patient has been with this cancer for a year and it barely changed? Then if they barely change and they cast seven, it's on the lower end of the spectrum, let's say it's like 30%, 40%, then I can consider sometimes injection of sandostat or linuretide if they have a dotative positive. If not, if they're a little bit more aggressive or I need shrinkage of the disease or try to shrink the disease and they're still at the lower end of the spectrum, I would go usually to the oral chemotherapy of capsidum and temozolomide a combination of two oral chemotherapy. Or if their two dotate is positive, I can consider PRRT in these patients. And I'm saying this is for the lower end of the spectrum because PRRT, it's an effective therapy, but at the end of the day, it's radiation and radiation takes time to work. So if a patient is on the higher end of the spectrum, their KS7 is 60 or 70%, I need something that's faster than radiation. So I tend to usually not do PRRT up front at least. I want to try to control the disease with something faster, which comes into the chemotherapy regimen. Can be capsidum and temozolomide, oral therapy, or it could be intravenous chemotherapy, like the ones that we used with the neuroendocrine carcinoma that probably differentiated like a carboplatin or splatin with etoposide and, and things like that. I really find it reassuring that you said there's nothing magical about the number right? There's no hard cut up at 20. And so, you know, being 22%, you don't have to feel like you're on this side of the line. And then just thank you for explaining so clearly how you weigh in all of these things into your treatment decision. So with all of those, it sounds like there's a variety of treatment options. You mentioned the somatostatin analogs, PRT, oral chemotherapy, CAPTEM, and maybe platinum-based ones. How are these different from other types of neuroendocrine tumors, the grade one, two, or other types that are out there? A lot of these treatments, probably the audience have already heard about because they're used for the grade one, two, or they're used for the pearl differentiated neck. So far, all of what I talked about is really based on what we call retrospective studies, meaning, you know, we've done uh, treatments in our center and then we're looking back now and see what's effective or not. And... It's important to know that the highest level of data and highest level of evidence is really from what we call prospective studies, phase two or phase three studies. Taking patients with neuroendocrine tumor that's grade three, well differentiated, and going with them and give them specific treatment that they follow along. That hasn't been done on grade three net. So that's the difference between it compared to grade one and two. The reason that this has not been done before is because this is all relatively new. 2016, it was the first time that was reclassified. And then 2019, the more reclassification for the other non-pancreatic net. But is it being done? Yes, it is. So that's why I say there's definitely a hope in neuroendocrine tumors. There's lots of these treatments are very effective. We see them in the clinic effective, but we need more supportive data to tell us that. Like, for example, one of the most recent guests, Dr. Chan, She's leading a very important study, and we participate in that study, the cabinet study, looking at cabozantinib and oral therapy. And we have that study here in Mayo, Arizona, and it does include patients with grade three well-differentiated net. So that's one of study available. There are other studies looking at, for example, newer types of PRRT and using different agents other than lutathera or lutetium-177. They're including grade three net. So... The positive thing is the grade three net is currently being studied and we have options for patients. Yeah, that's very hopeful. And you already talked a little bit about the scans and getting both a Dota T and FDG scan. How should the grade three nets be monitored and what kind of maybe blood tests, biomarkers, what else would you do to watch them? I would do the similar approach to what I usually do for other grade one and grade two net in terms of the functional scan, meaning the PET scan. I would do it only periodically as a kind of a checkpoint initially at diagnosis. And then if there is something that changed in the future, but in between when a patient is on therapy, I would do cross-sectional scans, whether CT scans or MRIs, just to monitor how things are. I don't see a benefit of doing a PET scan every single time. Because at the end of the day, I always tell patients that the PET scan is more of a scan of function rather than sizes. If we're interested in sizes more, CAT scans and MRIs give us 
much more better size. That more applies to the most common PET scan used in this country, which is the PET CT. We do have a advantage at Mayo in Arizona. We have a PET MRI, which combined the PET with the MRI and gives us the sizes as well and things like that. But again, even for that, I would do it only periodically. And how often would you do a CT or MRI to check the size? It varies case by case, but usually in a patient that's just starting on a new treatment, I would do it in two to three months. It's kind of not as far as that grade one where we say come back in six months. I would start at least with two to three months and then spread them out later on if things are stable. And then I usually get CVC and CMP. So just the usual pattern of hemoglobin, white blood cells, platelets, and kidney function, liver function. I don't typically follow chromogranin or other tumor markers. I don't find them very useful. If the patient has a functional neuroendocrine tumor, meaning that their cancer produces a hormone, let's say serotonin, then I do get the 5-HIA, usually get blood 5-HIA periodically in general. But my decision to change treatment or how the patient is doing is mainly based on how the patient is doing in terms of symptoms and the scans, not necessarily the numbers. Yeah, the scans and how they are feeling and looking. Exactly. So circling back to something we were touching on at the very beginning of the conversation about whether or not these tumors can change. You know, this topic comes up a lot. Can the tumors change in the grade in the KI-67, either up or down in the differentiation? And what's that likelihood that they may change? And is there anything we as patients could do to predict this or prevent it? Is there something we do to turn it on or off? Again, it's an excellent question, but I think it's very rare that this will happen. The less common thing is to change from well-differentiated to a poorly differentiated. Can it happen? Yes, it can. But I do see neuroendocrine tumors every single day, multiple patients a day. And last time I saw that, I think about two or two and a half years ago, where a well-differentiated has changed to a poorly differentiated. And I can tell you that the story of that patient was she got a pancreatic nut that was in the pancreas and it was a grade two and it was completely taken out. And then it came back in the liver two years afterwards. The liver was biopsied and it was still grade two. And she was monitored on sandostatin. And then suddenly her cancer within three months tripled in size. So that did not fit. So we biopsied and it transformed into a neuroendocrine carcinoma, poorly differentiated. So that would be the alarm. So can it happen? Yes, it can. What can a patient do is really if, if they have a specific concern, they should speak up to their doctor sharing, is this normal for the disease to act like this? Can it increase from one centimeter to uh, six centimeter within three months? I would say no, that's more aggressive than what we see in grade three nets. It's more of a neck, grade three neuroendocrine carcinoma that probably differentiated one. And we're working on that, and there are other groups also looking at that, like who are the patients who would transform and things like that. And that's kind of also one of the things I want to mention. I do think it is important, especially after one or two lines of therapy, to do next-generation sequencing on the cancer in grade 3 net. Now, in grade 1 and 2, we rarely find anything. I'll step back a little bit. By that, I mean to take the cancer cells and send them usually outside company or someone, they profile the tumor and they look literally at hundreds of mutations or gene errors in the cancer itself to look at if there is any specific target. Because from time to time, we find like a pill that works on this specific target in the cancer. That's more common in grade three net and grade three neck than a grade one and two. So I do think in a grade three net, I would do that. That's a really good point to get this done. You know, some people will say, I've already gotten genetic testing. How do I get this next generation sequence testing done? And what is it? Yeah, I think talking to your doctor, because all the doctors, all the medical oncologists are familiar with that. And their clinic would work with a specific company or something like that. So they can send it. As just to differentiate, the genetic testing can be either germline, which is the hereditary one, which is testing the things that you inherited from your father and mother. Or it can be what we call somatic, which is looking at the cancer cells. Yeah. So it's not necessarily a blood drawn looking at the genes. It's looking at the tumor itself and seeing the errors, as you said. Exactly. 
And right now, some companies have developed a technology where they actually isolate from a blood sample the cancer cells that are floating around and do the genetic testing on them. So it's technically doing a blood test, but on the cancer cells, not the things that we heard. Yeah, two different types of testing. Thank you for clarifying. And patients also wonder, is there something I can do with my diet to turn it on and off this likelihood of converting or changing diet, exercise, all the things that we might have control of? Yeah, I mean, I really encourage balanced diet, nothing extreme. You don't have to change your diet dramatically. I mean, yes, if you were on an unhealthy diet before, yeah, you should be on a balanced diet because nothing has been proven in terms of, you know, oh, a keto diet or eliminating this or that, that would help or change anything in this regard. And I always encourage being active and exercise. I mean, not necessarily been proven in neuroendocrine, but has been looked out extensively in colon cancer and breast cancer. It makes a huge difference. Yeah. Moving the body and a balanced diet. So we talked about tumors changing grades from well differentiated to poorly differentiated, and then the numbers changing. Can they go the other way? Can they change from a grade three to a grade two or one? Less likely. I would say if that would happen, it's probably maybe two different pathologists looking at it. You know, they're counting a little bit differently. I mean, there is a little bit of heterogeneity as well in the cancer, meaning that if the cancer is as big as a table, if you take a biopsy from this right side of the table, it might be a little bit different. Than that. But I wouldn't say, oh, it's a grade three and suddenly now gone to grade one, for example. Maybe it's a grade three, 23% cast seven, and now with counting again, it's 18%. Yeah, it's possible. But most of the cases that I've seen like this are usually the pathologist outside saw something, and when we got it here, we just recounted, reassigned the grade. That's a really good point, and we saw this with the story that we mentioned, right? The other pathologist saw it was a poorly differentiated grade three neuroendocrine carcinoma. How often is that the case that there's a differing opinions that make such a difference in the diagnosis and treatment? Unfortunately, more common than we want. That's why in every patient that I get from outside, I do get the tissue reviewed by our pathologist because it is unfortunately more common. I'm not saying it's very common, but more common than what we want, especially when it gets to grade three net versus grade three neck. That's a hard distinction for some pathologists who are not familiar with neuroendocrine tumors. And how is it that, I guess, Mayo pathologists or any other net centers that they would be able to know and understand this difference? I think because they're more aware of the new data and because of the volume that they see. So our pathologist who look at net, that pathologist does not look at breast cancer, for example. All what they're seeing every day is neuroendocrine tumors and GI cancers. So that's where the experience comes in and the volume of the patients that they're seeing. Yeah, it matters. So... Just a couple questions left. And one, I know you touched on clinical trials and some that you mentioned, the cabinet study that Dr. Jennifer Chen is leading, and you mentioned the alpha studies. What clinical trials are you most excited about that you think we should be aware of? Exciting new trials in the pipeline specifically for grade three neuroendocrine tumors. Yeah. So for example, the cabinet is exciting. It would be nice to see how it comes in. But I think one of the studies, the Composed study, for example, would be interesting is looking at different mechanism of action in the PRT with a newer agent. That would be interesting to see how it pans out. There is another study also asking the question whether should we use KRRT or CAT-7. It's also including grade 3 neuroendocrine tumors. I think all of these are exciting because the challenge is all what we have right now is our retrospective studies based on experience and things like that. So it would be nice to have that validated in a more organized fashion with newer regimens as well and newer treatments. Yeah. More data equals more treatment and that will be more hopeful. Exactly. Yeah. So in closing, what final words of hope would you like to leave the neuroendocrine tumor community with? I would say that I'm definitely hopeful and optimistic. I am biased because I'm a medical oncologist and we're always optimistic, but I do back up this optimism by things have changed significantly over the last five or six years and they are changing every single day and we're getting better every single day in different modalities and different disciplines, you know, surgeries are better, systemic treatments and chemotherapies are better. And what I can promise you is we are doing our best and hoping I'm praying for the best 
and getting definitely more and more therapies, hopefully, on board to help our patients. Well, with champions like you, you give us reason to be hopeful for Thanks. better understanding, more clear diagnosis, and more treatments out there. As you said, this is a pretty new entity. So how much things have changed, even defining this entity to now better understanding and more and more treatments, and we hope for more in the future. Yep. Thank you so much for joining us today for the clear ways that you explain things. And we really look forward to more data coming out, more treatments, and more hope for all of us. Thank you. Same here. It was a pleasure for sure. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for listening to the LACNETS podcast. Go to our website, lacnets.org forward slash podcast for episode transcripts, resources, and patient stories. We want to thank our podcast supporters, Ipsen, ITM, Advanced Accelerator Applications, Tercera Therapeutics, and Lantheus. For more information about neuroendocrine cancer, go to www.lacnets.org. LACNETS depends on donations to bring you programs such as this podcast please consider making a donation at lacnets.org forward slash donate.